So last time I, we did this, how more property for, for out of, or for out of uh, uh, treat of the tree. So maybe I'll, I'll briefly go over that again since that felt a little rushed to me last time. Um, but other than that, are there any questions from last time? Okay, so yeah, maybe let me uh, briefly, uh, so let me remind you the goal that we're, we're trying to get to, and that is that we had, uh, so we had the, the tree, we were really only interested in the calygraph of F2. So we have the tree, which was the calygraph of a free group on two generators. And we had some collection of uh, geodesics in the tree. So these are, so F2 here is going to be gamma. Uh, so we had some collection of geodesics in gamma, uh, which is going to be uh, gamma invariant. So invariant under the translation of the, of the free group. So we have that gamma times is equal to this, right? Where gamma x diagonally on gamma squared. And then from this, we created this uh, co-cycle. So which I denoted by alpha gamma. And here we needed that the length of gamma was less than or equal to k for gamma in, in um, w. So this was between, well, one, is, one doesn't contribute. So we'll take the length between two and k. Uh, and then we created this co-cycle, uh, which I'll remind you, so this was, uh, had x, y, and z and they were elements in the tree or on the boundary. And you created this co-cycle by, you got this picture here, this tripod. So since it's a tree, this is a triangle. Uh, so we had this picture here. And then the, the co-cycle was, it was the co-boundary of this operator, which uh, this operator just added up every time you saw, you went from uh, X to Y, and whenever you saw a W, you would contribute it. So then when you look at the co-boundary, you get exactly, uh, you know, these words that appear here, but uh, that overlap the triple point. Uh, and this was this co-cycle, so I'm not going to write it out uh, completely, but it's, uh, it's, so this maps the closure of the tree, the triples, and map this into uh, L1 of W. And then from here, you could map it into, well, anywhere you had some gamma equivariant embedding, but in particular to L2 of W is what we are going to most care about. But you can map it to other Bonnock spaces or other Hilbert spaces or, you know, where you have a representation, uh, whatever you want. And, and the goal was to show that this was always a non-trivial co-cycle. So the goal is that if uh, W is not equal to the empty set, in which case you get zero, then alpha W is non-trivial as a, as a bounded co-cycle into L2 of W. So this is the goal. And to do that, the first step we did last time was uh, we showed that the uh, tree auto, uh, the tree automorphism group had the how more property. So uh, I'll rewrite this out. So the theorem was that the automorphism group of the tree has the how more property. So i.e. every unitary representation uh, without invariant vectors, without non-zero invariant vectors, uh, is mixing, meaning that the C0 representations, uh, meaning that the matrix coefficients are C0 functions. That's what we mean by mixing representation. And then uh, let me give you again a proof sketch. So we did this last time, but I felt that it was a little rushed. So let me just give you a brief overview. And then 
If you want to, you can go back and look at the last lecture or you can look at the notes that are online and, uh, and you can see this in more detail. Uh, but the idea was that we want to use special properties of we, uh, certain subgroups. So we had that, uh, so let me, let me call G to be the automorphism group of the tree. And then we had uh, K was, I'll just do this for the Cayley graph here. Um, so K was the stabilizer subgroup of the identity element in the tree or the, or in general fix any origin, that's fine. Uh, and then we had uh, the, we had a copy of the integers, which was generated by some translation T. And in the case, uh, so the only point of this translation is that it moved along a geodesic. Uh, but uh, for us, you could do this explicitly by taking, for example, if this is a free group, you just take T to be A. And then this translates, here's the Cayley graph of F2. And so A just kind of translates everything in this direction. So, and then we had this decomposition, so then G is equal to K, uh, A plus K, just like SL2R has a decomposition like this. So K, I should mention this is compact. Uh, and we have this decomposition K, A plus K, where A plus is just a set of positive powers or non-negative powers. Um, and we saw that because, uh, yeah, if you take any trans, any automorphism, then you can rotate it so that the origin gets sent to the positive real line, and then you can apply some A to move it back to the origin, and then you're back in the stabilizer. Uh, and then we also had these two subgroups, the very important subgroups, uh, which we call B plus. So this was the set of G and G such that a G point, uh, uh, pointwise fixes a neighborhood of the point at infinity. So here's A infinity, here's A minus infinity. And by that, I mean just the geodesic AN tends to that point on the boundary. And we had B minus a set of G and G, such that G pointwise fixes a neighborhood of a minus infinity. And then you can just check that uh, just as sets, if you take B minus plus and B minus, you get the whole group G. So in particular, the group is generated by these two subgroups. Um, but this is an exercise. And then the key properties we used uh, is we used, uh, one is that to prove how more, you just need to prove that representations without G invariant vectors are mixing when restricted to A, because we have this KAK decomposition. So we have here uh, step one. So, to prove how more, so since, since G is equal to K, A plus K, to prove how more, uh, we just need to show, show that if we have a representation pi, has no invariant vectors, so then when we look at pi and then times positive powers of this Tn, then this converges to zero and the weak operator topology as n tends to infinity. All right, because we have this kk decomposition, as soon as this happens, then the representation is mixing. That was step one that we used. 
So then we want to just prove this. And so we suppose this is not the case. Uh, if this doesn't hold, well, and that's not how we did it. What we said is, uh, so in order to prove this, we'll take any weak operator topology cluster point. So these are unitary, so they're in the uniball. The uniball or the, the uniball is compact in the weak operator topology. So let's take any accumulation point. So let's take S in accumulation point. in the weak operator topology. So this, so the unitaries are not compact, but this will be in the uniball of H. We want to hopefully show a zero. And then the thing to notice is that uh, here's, you know, a key, the key step two is that we had this property that if we took things in B, so if B is in B plus. So then we have that when we started conjugating it by um, things in A, so notice A normalizes both B plus and uh, B minus. And the thing to notice is that if we start conjugating, I guess if we apply uh, Tn, that shifts everything to the right, then we apply B, which fixes a neighborhood, and then we shift it back to the left. So this means we fix larger and larger neighborhoods as we conjugate it. So we have that T uh, N B or T minus N T N uh, converges to the identity uh, as N goes to N B. And this is in the group. And so since our representation is continuous, this in particular means that we have strong operator topology convergence. Converges to the identity operator, and this is in the strong operator topology. And similarly, so also, um, if B is in B minus, then we get that if we take positive, so this, yeah, so if we take positive powers, then negative powers, then this again converges in the identity as n tends to positive infinity, hence uh, pi of tn, pi of b, pi of tn here converges, uh, this time the inverse should be there, and this again converges to one in the strong operator. And from step two, so this is sometimes in books when they prove how more they separate this out as uh, they call the lemma, they call it Mottner's lemma, uh, which just says that, um, that it follows from step two that uh, then if we look at S and then we look at times pi of B, this is equal to S. Right, and that's just because uh, right S is going to be some weak cluster point of pi weak weak accumulation point of pi T n, uh, so S is roughly equal to pi T n, and then we use the conjugation and write this as roughly pi T n times something that's very close to one, and then we use the fact that strong operator topology times weak operator topology still gives you convergence in the weak operator topology. Um, it's not true that, uh, you know, of course, if you have two sequences that converge in the weak operator topology, then their products need not converge to what you would expect. Uh, even if you take a sequence of unitaries and its adjoint also converges to zero, maybe, but then the unitary times its adjoint is the constant one sequence. Uh, however, if one of them converges strongly, then this is true. And that's the fact I'm using here. Uh, so this is for all B and B plus. And similarly, by replacing S, by replacing the positive powers with the negative powers and replacing S with S star, we get that pi B of S star is equal to S star for all B. So this is B plus and this is for all B and B minus. And so combining these two, two facts, uh, so this was you know maybe step three and then step four, is combining these two, we get the therefore 
pi b of s star s is equal to s star s. And this is for all b in b plus union uh, b minus, and hence also the group they generate, which is all of g. Uh, and this is since this is since um, that S is in pi of a double commutator, du double commutator, which is abelian. So both S and S star are in here, which is abelian. Hence, uh, hence you can switch S and S star, and therefore we get this for both B plus and B minus. Uh, but of course, that means that the range, so therefore the range of S or anything in the range of s, s star s, uh, is exactly equal to the space of g invariant vectors, which we're assuming to be zero, which then implies that s star s is zero, which implies that s is zero. All right. So that was a brief overview. This is a really nice argument. I like this argument, so I think it's good to go over it again. All right, so that's the how more property. And, uh, and like I said before, you can take this proof and you can uh, repeat it uh, pretty much verbatim if you just take G to be SL2R, K to be SO2, um, and then you take uh, B plus, to be the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. So like this, and you take B minus to be the subgroup of lower triangular matrices like this. Uh, and then you take A to be diagonal matrices. And you have A plus to be uh, diagonal matrices where, where lambda is greater than one. So this is lambda uh, greater than or greater than zero, and this is lambda greater than one. So a plus is not a subgroup; it's just a subset. Uh, so if you take these sets and subgroups and you put them in the proof, then it works just as well kind of for there. And from once you prove the Helmore property for SL two, you can generalize this to SLN pretty easily. Um, but I won't. There's just one more step. All right. But we're really interested in this for the tree uh, automorphism. All right, any questions about that? All right, I like this argument. Okay, so what do I want the Helmor property for? Well, one nice consequence of the Helmor property. So note that if uh, G has the Helmore property. And if we have any representation by mapping G, G of H a representation And let's say we have some subgroup, uh, and I think I'll call it T, just, oh no, T is for the, and they call it H. And if we have H and G non-compact, so then if you look at the H invariant vectors, they're automatically G invariant. So vectors that are fixed by H are automatically vectors that are fixed by G. And why is that? That's because uh, this is since if we look at the matrix coefficient corresponding to these, and we look at pi of H, C, C. If we look at this, uh, well, this is the constant one function. And so if we, again, project onto the space of non-G invariant. Uh, so we'll take the, so since, let me do this, right? So if C is in 
H H. Uh, and we let uh, P be the projection onto HG. So then we can look at pi of H, and then we look at the orthogonal projection of C, or C, and we look at this. Uh, but on one hand, we have that this is, of course, uh, pi of h commutes with the orthogonal projection because it commutes with the projection itself. And so since c is fixed, this is nothing but the norm of p perp squared. But on the other hand, we know that this is a c0 function. So it vanishes at infinity on g and h is non-compact. So we know that therefore this goes to zero as h tends to infinity. Um, so that says that this vector C has to already be inside the G invariant uh, vectors. So this is a nice consequence of the Helmore property. If you have any non-compact subgroup of your group, uh, as soon as you know a vector is fixed by that subgroup, you know it's, it's fixed for the whole group. Uh, in particular, therefore, uh, wait, I need to, okay, we'll put a pin on that. We'll keep that in mind. And then I want to do use one more property about the free group sitting inside the automorphism group. And that is, uh, so again, recall that uh, K is the uh, stabilizer subgroup of the identity, uh, the origin, maybe that means O for origin, uh, of the Cayley graph, the free group. And this was compact and open. And the next thing I'll notice is note that if we consider a free group on two generators sitting inside of the automorphism group of the tree of the Cayley graph, so that this is a discrete uh, subgroup, uh, discrete. Uh, so why is that? Well, remember the topology on this group uh, that uh, sequencer net converges uh, to the identity if and only if they eventually fix each vertex in the tree. But if you have a sequence of uh, elements of the free group, uh, once they fix the origin, then that has to be the identity element. So as soon as they fix one point, they fix all the points. And so that exactly says that uh, you're a discrete sum, or it directly implies you're, it's a discrete sum. So the free group's a discrete subgroup of this group. And then the other thing I want to remark on is that uh, it's actually a lattice. So this, uh, is also a lattice. So a lattice, what does that mean? There's two equivalent ways to think about it. Uh, so uh, there exists a, a G invariant uh, probability measure on the quotient G mod uh, F2, I'm just gonna call this gamma to save notation. Uh, there's a, a G invariant probability measure on gamma or equivalently, uh, there's a fundamental domain. Uh, there is a uh, Borel subset uh, of G, uh, let's call it X of G with finite Haar measure such that G is a disjoint union of the translates of X. Uh, T, T, 
right? So this is a well-known equivalence. I won't prove this. You can look it up in, in books, uh, any books that introduces the notion of a lattice and a group should talk about this. Uh, so this, the standard example of lattice to think about is like the integers sitting inside the reals. And there you can take your fundamental domain. You can take the half open interval from zero to one, uh, for example. Uh, for the free group, uh, it's easy to see its lattice. In fact, it's easy to see what the fundamental domain is. Uh, for, for us, for this setting, um, you just check that uh, our tree automorphism group is a disjoint union over T in the free group of K times T. So this open, compact open subgroup itself is the fundamental domain. Right, and let's think of why that's true. Well, uh, if you think about what this is saying, all we're saying is that if you, you can get from each element of the group G can be uniquely written as an element of the free group times an element that stabilizes the origin. And this is really a triviality because we know that the free group acts freely and transitively on the tree so if you have any element of the group, there's an element of the free group that moves a unique element of the free group that moves uh, the group. Well, let me prove this. Why is this the case? Uh, this is because, so if G is in uh, G, there is a unique uh, element T in gamma, such that G times the origin uh, is equal to T times the origin. But what does that say? That says that therefore uh, T inverse times G is in K, it must fix the origin. So I, and we have G is therefore equal to T times T inverse G so we've written it as uniquely as something in gamma times something in K. I guess I wanted the other way around, just take inverse and then you get the unique decomposition the other way around. Right? Okay, so that shows that uh, each element in G can uniquely be written as something in K times something in gamma, which exactly says that K is a fundamental domain for gamma in this. So, so the free group's a lattice in this tree automorphism. And then uh, what does that mean? So that means the, the following, uh, let's see, am I ready to, uh, yeah, so this means the, this has the following consequence. So therefore, uh, or maybe let me write this out as like a proposition or something. So proposition, if uh, H in this automorphism group of the tree is non-compact, and if uh, pi mapping gamma, so gamma here is the free group, to the unitary group of H is any unitary representation, So then if we look at the functions, the bounded functions from um, G mod H taking values in script H that are gamma uh, equivariant. So, uh, so let me, I'll write this out explicitly what I mean here, uh, but let me state what I want to prove first is that this is nothing but the uh, constant, uh, uh, hold on here, um, it's naturally, it's naturally isomorphic rather to just the fixed points in H. Right? And this is uh, where 
and with the name of G mod H, gamma uh, denotes the space of functions, of essentially bounded functions. Uh, F this that are equivariant. So such that F of uh, gamma X is, let me, to make it easier, let me take G mod H this way. Um, so I'll think of these as right H cosets because I want to think of gamma as acting on the right. So this is where f of x gamma is equal. We should probably put an inverse there then, and then this is equal to pi of gamma f of x uh, for, for all x and not h gamma gamma. Right, so we look at the space of equivariant essentially bounded to equivariant functions. And I claim that this is uh, naturally isomorphic to just the fixed points. In fact, I, I claim this in a natural way. I just claim that they're constants. So I, I claim that this is actually uh, equal to this space, which we identify, which we view as constant functions. We view All right, so this is the theorem I want to prove. So let's make sure we understand this. Uh, if we take any non-compact, it should be closed, uh, closed non-compact subgroup. And if we take any unitary representation, then the, uh, the only, any equivariant function, any bounded equivariant function is automatically constant. So that's the statement. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, so the proof is uh, almost a triviality. Uh, the only thing we have to notice is that this space on the left I've written here uh, embeds into a representation of G. So that's the thing we have, well, without the H. So notice that um, right, so the proof is as follows. So we identify uh, G mod H gamma equivariant with L infinity functions of G mapping into H that are H left invariant and they're gamma equivariant. So this is um, just identifying G mod H with the H orbit of G, we get this identification. So these are uh, functions mapping G to H, essentially bounded, such that F of H G T is T inverse is equal to pi of T F of G for G and G, H and H, and T. All right, so these are the left H invariant and a right uh, gamma equivariant functions. Uh, we have this natural identification. Uh, and this space right here, uh, we can naturally endow with an inner product that makes it a G representation. Uh, so that's, or makes it, uh, yeah, a G representation. Um, rather the space without looking at the H invariant vectors. So uh, on, so we define uh, an inner product on L infinity of G H gamma equivariant by uh, the following. So if we look at uh, F G, uh, I don't want to use G because that looks like the group element. So I'll take the F and H 
And what I'll do is I'll just look at what it is at an element of G. And notice that if we look at F G, H G, well, this gives us a function of G, but notice that if we multiply on the right by gamma, then the, the equivariance changes it to a pi, and then the pi's uh, cancel each other out. So this function right here is a function, uh, so this is in, uh, well, it's in L infinity, it's a bounded function because F and G are bounded, and it's in G, but it's invariant with respect to gamma. So this is a function in L infinity of G mod gamma, and hence we can integrate. So this is uh, over G mod gamma with, with whatever measure we have there. Uh, because it's a lattice, so it has a finite probability measure. Okay, so this defines an inner product on this space right here. Uh, and so whenever you have an inner product, naturally you can take a completion or a separation completion, you get a Hilbert space. So we define this Hilbert space H tilde is the completion of this. This space. And then the thing to notice is that there's a natural representation of G on the Hilbert space which is given by left multiplication. So we have a representation, this is called the induced representation uh, of G on the Hilbert space H, and this is given by pi tilde of G uh, times F, and you need to know what this does at some X, and this is formula we've seen before, it's just like that. And then it's pretty simple to check that this representation preserves this inner product. So this is a unitary representation of G. So here's a unitary representation of G. And what have we written here? So we have this space, which naturally embeds inside of it. And when we look at the H invariant functions, uh, we see that so that's exactly the fixed points under the H. Right, so then, I have to move on to the next page, sorry about that. So then uh, this L infinity uh, space, so uh, what notation is that? G, uh, G taking values in H, H times gamma. Uh, this is a subspace of the H fixed points under this, uh, maybe let me write it just like that. It's exactly the H, the sub, subspace of the H fixed points of this. And remember this, we already identified with L infinity of, of G mod H equivariant functions here. But I just remarked before that whenever you have a unitary representation of a Hal Moore group and you have a non-compact group, then as soon as a vector is fixed by H, it's automatically fixed by G. Right, so this is actually equal to the G fixed space by how more? So the space here that we want to try to compute is actually the same as the G fixed vector. So once a vector is H fixed, it's already G fixed. So what do we get? We get that therefore, this space L infinity of G mod H is actually equal to L infinity of G mod G. But of course here we're just saying that these are exactly the constant functions. So this is exactly H gamma, which is what we wanted to prove. Are there any questions about that? All right, so this is just a, a consequence of the Helmore property. No. All right, so how does this help us? So what, what does this have to do with bounded cohomology at all? 
Well, now we can prove the uh, theorem that Mono and Shalom proved. So here's the theorem is that um, if uh, you have, if you have some function alpha, uh, oh, one more observation. Here's the last observation, which we'll need to, to prove this non-vanishing theorem. And that is, uh, so how does this help us with cohomology? And that's the observation that the action of the automorphism group uh, so its action on the boundary of the tree is transitive, but it's actually too transitive, is uh, too transitive. And this is, uh, this is really an observation. If you think about it, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to see that um, uh, if you have two geodesics, if you have two pairs of geodesics, so you have your you have your tree, and if you take two pairs of geodesics, maybe your favorite one like this, and then you take two other pairs of geodesics, you know something that oh, I should use that dark blue is hard to see, uh, something like this, and something like this then uh, it's not difficult to convince yourself that you can just uh, rotate, uh, you can rotate the, the red lines and the blue lines uh, to flip or to move the red lines to the blue lines by just rotating uh, various branches of the tree how you want. Uh, so therefore the automorphism group of the tree is actually too transitive on the boundary. So any pair of rays can be mapped to any other, any pair of distinct rays can be mapped to any other pair of distinct rays in, in this way. Uh, so, um, uh, may, maybe it's, I've given too easy of a picture, maybe it looks too easy. How about uh, a more interesting picture is something like, because the picture I gave you, maybe you think it's intransitive. Uh, but here's maybe a better picture as, as if something like, like this, All right? If, if, two of the, if the two blue rays start out in the same direction, then it's less obvious of how to do this, but uh, it's still not difficult to do, uh, to find that you can take both of these points and map them to those two points. Um, one way to see that, um, well, I'll let you think about this, but this is this is not hard. Uh, and in fact, you can figure out once you know it's too transitive, you can figure out what is so it's a homogeneous space. So the boundary on the so therefore, so the quick conclusion is is that therefore uh, if we look at the boundary direct product the boundary, and let's take away the diagonal points. So I'll denote that by delta. So when we take the boundary direct product the boundary, and we take away the diagonal points, this is a homogeneous space. This is naturally uh, just automorphism group of uh, the tree modulo, and then you just take your favorite two geodesics and it's the stabilizer of those two. So how about stabilizer of a infinity and a minus infinity. So the stabilizer of these two uh, points right here. Right, I guess it's the, inter the intersection of the stabilizers. It should be more precise. And the other thing you should notice is that this set right here so this is going to be my H, and this is non-compact. In fact, it contains 
the translates of A will go ahead and fix both A infinity and A negative infinity. So this is a non-compact subgroup. Uh, so how does that help us uh, as a consequence of that? And then together with this last observation, so we get the therefore, if pi mapping gamma to uh, U of H is any representation, any unitary representation, So we have, uh, and uh, if we have any unitary representation, um, uh, and we fix the, so of course, it's also one transitive, so the action on gamma is also a homogeneous space, so it has a natural uh, quasi-invariant measure. And if we fix mu, a quasi-invariant measure, so this is a G quasi-invariant measure on the boundary. Uh, so then, what do we have? We have that uh, L infinity of uh, the boundary times the boundary uh, with respect to the product measure, mu times mu, taking values in H, and then we look at the gamma equivariant functions here. Well, this is exactly the setting of the previous theorem where you have here, this is a homogeneous space and the product measure is the Haar measure. Uh, and so we're looking at this, this is exactly L infinity of G mod H with the Haar measure. And we're looking at equivariant functions in H. And so by the previous theorem, this is exactly the constant functions. So this is exactly equal to H gamma of the constant functions. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the conclusion so far, and this is the key property that helps us compute cohomology, because if you remember, if you want something to be a co-boundary, being a co-boundary means that you're a boundary of some function in here. But now we have a complete description of this space. It's exactly just the constant functions and that's it. You don't get much trivial. So as a corollary of this, the corollary is that you can identify the bounded cohomology uh, for the two, this is only works for the two cohomology, the bounded two cohomology of this action with values in any Hilbert space. So for any representation, this is a canonically isomorphic to just any, uh, any functions, any equivariant functions on the triple boundary. So this is just canonically isomorphic to L infinity functions here. This, so this is as a measure space, as a measure space to L infinity functions on the triple equivariant functions. Uh, so, sorry, uh, I don't mean all functions, but I just mean um, uh, the kernel. It's, right, the, it's all functions which are in the kernel of this. Uh, it's exactly, right, well, it's exactly the space of co-cycles is what I mean to say, uh, is equal to the space of bounded co-cycles, um, which are just uh, yeah, functions, which I'll remind you, I'll just write it out explicitly. It's exactly the space of uh, functions, alpha uh, and L infinity 
of the cubes taking values in H that are equivariant uh, such that the boundary of alpha is zero. So, uh, or in other words, uh, every co-cycle, the only co-cycles that are co-boundaries the, is the zero co-cycle. And so this is a very special case that uh, works for H2 because you have this property here uh, that I've listed here that uh, there are no non-constant functions uh, that are equivariant on the on uh, the boundary squared. So this is the key property that's used. Uh, and this can be generalized. So this was generalized by Berger and Mono, uh, where in fact they showed that you can replace this space. So this is a special space of the Poisson. This is a particular example of the Poisson boundary. And they showed that using a theorem of Kaimanovich, uh, which was again very similar to this. So there's a double ergodicity theorem of Kaimanovich which exactly shows that this equation, which we derived here, is true for all Poisson boundaries. And so you get this uh, for all Poisson boundaries. Um, but I didn't want to introduce the notion of Poisson boundaries because that would take a little bit too much time. So that's why I gave a direct proof uh, for this special case um, that, we, that we're using here. So if if maybe it looks like this argument was ad hoc, I just want to say that this does fit in with a more general uh, systematic uh, calculation where, where you consider the Poisson boundary here instead of this particular boundary of a tree. Uh, in particular, nothing, it turns out that nothing was special about the tree. You could put a hyperbolic group here and you have the exact same uh, corollary. I should remark that you can also put any uh, separable dual Banach space here. Uh, so we put Hilbert space, I guess, maybe I should have said separable Hilbert space somewhere. Maybe, maybe in this argument we use separability somewhere. Um, but you can also do any separable dual Banach space works just as well. Um, uh, yeah, and more generally this holds for all Poisson boundaries. So this, this is a really powerful, powerful result. However, what you'll notice is that this shows that this is the boundary cohomology for the action on the boundary. Right? This is specific for the action on the boundary. To get that the original co-cycles are not uh, cohomology or not uh, co-boundaries, uh, that's what uh, will take a little bit more work. So we'll do that step on Monday. So to go from from this statement to actually saying that if alpha is non-zero, then alpha is a co-boundary on the, on the level of the group. That'll take one more ingredient. All right, so let me go ahead and stop here. Are there any questions about this? All right, well, fantastic. In that case, I'll stop here and I'll